So hello uh, now from uh, the live Zoom studio. I have the wonderful and exciting pleasure to be now really online with uh, Larry Oxman. And um, when actually we changed plans from just the keynote presentation, Larry proposed to make a conversation, which I think is a wonderful idea because it's so much more appropriate for online sessions. Nevertheless, I think it's not necessary to introduce Larry Oxman to our audiences. She's really world famous for the mediated meta group that she created on MIT Media Lab uh, 10 years ago. We just talked about it. It's the 10 years anniversary. So it's uh, really very exciting to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Gerfried. And, uh... Uh, I'm excited to join the Ars Electronica community. I'm sorry that this is not happening in person. <laughs> well, likewise, but definitely it's the highlight of our first day. We started uh, this morning already with our program. It's a huge uh, international network and uh, I'm sure many people are now really interested in using this opportunity to hear more about your work, what you are doing and uh, for me, the first question I would have, of course, is going a little bit back to the origins of you know, why did you become such a wonderful example of this interdisciplinary, not only work and researcher, but interdisciplinary person as well. And I wrote in your biography that you say that you grew up between nature and culture. So what does this mean and how was this uh, situation maybe already the the starting point of your career. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was just uh, commenting to a friend of mine the other day about my father, who I hope is online and watching us. Um, <clears throat> and he, I, I, I was telling this friend, I, I said, my father, you give him a book uh, and a tree and he's happy. Uh, and uh, that's all he needs in life. And, and I think I grew up uh, in kind of the same way um, with, with a tree, a garden, uh, and a book, a library, and um, and between my ha my parents' house and my grandmother's house, I sort of traveled, uh, you know, 25 meters between the library and the garden throughout life. But I was very, very lucky, I think, and very grateful for the opportunities I have had as as a youngster, my sister and I, to be exposed to to architecture, to design through my parents' life and work. They've been architects. Uh, both professionally uh, practicing architecture and academics all their lives, and um, and exposed you know to the art world uh, in in such a meaningful way, and 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 of course the the love of nature came from my mother. So I really um I, I really got the best of both worlds, and I'm so grateful for that. I should also say that I mean I I, I believe in a slow and uh, serendipitous education, even if it's long. And I, I did go to medical school before architecture. I, I did go to a science school before <clears throat> going to a design school at the Technion, later on at the Architectural Association in London, and, uh, and then um, a technology school. So, so from science to art and design through engineering, I sort of had the opportunity through my education, first degree, second degree, the diploma, later the PhD and the faculty position to um, to enjoy uh, all, all of these different views uh, of the world through education. Wonderful. We, we just saw from our Rishi here this uh, um, screen, this slide. Uh, you sent us some slides that we can have some nice images to our conversation. And I think it's a, a very uh, central um, uh, issue to, to your whole career and your work. Maybe we can get this uh, also back on the on the shared screen to talk a little bit about it, because yeah. it's all about this um, interactivity, interdisciplinarity, I mean, all these keywords and buzzwords of the digital revolution are kind of accumulating in your work. And, and I think it's it's really not far-fetching to, to call you kind of uh, one of the best examples probably of this often referred to new Renaissance type of uh, scientist, uh, artist, designer, engineer. And um, probably it's no surprise that you ended up in MIT Media Lab in uh, 2005. Uh, but then in 2010, when you started your own lab, uh, when you became professor there, 
you added a very, very important element to it, which I think until then was uh, barely really uh, represented enough uh, in, in MIT Media Lab, which is the society as a background. So that it's not only about this collaboration of art design on one side, engineering and science on the others, but give it this perspective of uh, sustainable and responsible approach to engineering, to science as well, and as design. I mean, how did this come about? Yeah, I think, again, um, uh, a lot of, uh, I, I found a home in the Media Lab. The Media Lab definitely felt like, I always say, a second home for, for, for my mind and a second home for my family, my, my students. Um, and in the diagram, which you just showed, uh, you can see sort of, uh, I would say, my contribution to the Media Lab and, and the approach that we've taken at the Media Lab. Uh, when I arrived to the Media Lab, and I think it, it's probably unfair to say that the, the Media Lab has not dealt with societal issues, it has. But when I arrived to the Media Lab, the, there were uh, sort of four lenses uh, through which to approach societal issues. Uh, and those lenses were art, science, engineering, and design, and they were discrete, uh, or the, at least they were drawn as discrete. This is the diagram I was given by the head of the Media Lab at the time of these four discrete rubrics. And what I did is I turned them into a circle. Um, and that circle basically enables a kind of a fusing uh, or this continuous reading of the disciplines in the context of societal pro problems. So for example, um, this is vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, the Bauhaus wheel diagram from 1922, uh, which we can talk about. But in, in the Krebs cycle of creativity, which I've created, you're sort of moving between um, uh, science, the, the, that, uh, yeah, yeah, the role of science is to predict and explain the world around us. So it converts information into knowledge. Engineering takes that knowledge and creates utility. Design takes that utility and creates a new, um, occupation of the world, a new uh, habitation of the world, and art takes this existing condition and creates a new perception of the world. And at that 12 midnight point, the Cinderella moment is where art, in, art informs uh, science, not only inspires it. And so in, in the Krebs cycle, uh, the input for one domain is the output for another, and they really act in tandem. And um, what is special, I think, about our work over the past decade has been the ability to address bigger questions through the cycle that is a circle as opposed to a four um, distinct rubric diagram. Uh, in the Bauhaus diagram, uh, also uh, a pedagogical um, sort of form a formulation of bringing the disciplines together, at the center, you do find the product, the building, or the site, or the 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 the, the actual baum, you know. But in our uh, cycle, uh, you find awareness and the quality of uh, being aware in the world and being able to approach the world not from a product-centric or even a human-centric point of view, um, <clears throat> but from more of a process-centric. Uh, and um, uh, one that respects technology not only as a tool, um, but as a new, as a as a as a, uh, a lens through which to view the world in a different way. And so that cycle also enabled us to unite between the units of the built environment, the um, digital environment, and the biological environment. And so here you see in the cycle how. You convert genes into atoms, atoms into bits, bits into the units of perception, and the units of perception into genes. We can talk more about that, but I've tried to place a certain of the uh, fields at the Media Lab um, and group names at the Media Lab in this cycle and show how it, how it all works together. And, and in this process, you were really starting to combine some of the kind of at this time very hyped new technologies like 3D printing, digital fabrication with uh, materials that were rather unusual. So again, we have this combination of really looking at nature as a source of inspiration, but also as material for your work, but not in a sort of say contradictionary way to technology, but in a kind of complementary. And I think that's something I would really like to hear a little bit more from you, how you think that is, because many people I think, or, or quite a lot of people rather see this always as opponents, and it's yeah. always like nature versus uh, technology. 
But then again, this is what human culture and civilization is all about how we connect exactly. these two things. So. Absolutely. And now more than ever, I think, uh, especially in the age of COVID and climate change, we can see that you know, culture begets nature, nature begets culture. There are obviously implications, ramifications um, for our use and abuse of the natural world and how it affects um, human civilization on our planet. Um, I mean, you're looking at some of my team members putting together this project Aguahoja, which was a um, tall structured uh, whose skins are entirely made of natural materials that were sourced in the natural world, uh, the most abundant biopolymers on the planet, including uh, chitosan, cellulose, pectin, uh, calcium carbonate, etc. cetera. Um, and here we had to develop new processes in order to uh, process and place these materials uh, in gradients that were functional, meaning where we could control almost like alchemists, the distribution of properties such as mechanical strength and optical uh, transparency slash translucency across the surface area of the structure. I think that, uh, and you were asking me um, uh, about, um, about the, 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 the team, uh, I think, one of uh, the things that, that unites us or that creates a, sort of a, a unique uh, uh, atmosphere of work in our group is that indeed we don't look at nature as a sort of a resource. That would be a very reductive approach um, and very much in the spirit of biomimetics or bioemulation where, okay, this is nature, uh, this is a resource, let's look at it, let's try to emulate. Uh, but we rather try to push towards biointegrated approaches and even biosynthetic pro approaches where the ultimate Turing test uh, for, for my team would be, you know, when you look at a project and you're unable to say, was it man-made, woman-made, or was it um, a human-made, or was it nature-made, nature-grown? Um, of course, nature is, men is, and women are part of nature, and there's whole philosophical discussion around that. But, um, but material ecology's turn test really is uh, that kind of singularity, material singularity, where you cannot differentiate between what is grown and what is built. Um, because as designers, as artists, as technologists, we're approaching an age where we can uh, access and alter the units of the physical world uh, through digital, physical, and biological tools that are entirely integrated. So I would say, rather than biomimetic, we, we lean towards sort of on the way to biosynthetic, towards bio-integrated bio uh, projects and processes. Mm -hmm. I think one interesting aspect besides this, you know, continuous uh, bridging between uh, nature uh, and technology is also when one listens to your talks or explanations, like just uh, right now, you always go very fast from talking about you and the I to talking about we. And probably this is, uh, I would say, one of the recipes of your success as a research team. Is this a necessity to sort of say, survive in this jungle of interdisciplinarity? Absolutely, yes. Um, I think, I mean, if you look at the greatest projects of civilizations from civilization from, you know, the great, great pyramids of Giza to, uh, to SpaceX most recently, uh, they were all team projects. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, <laughs> Joseph Boyce, you know, used to say art is, uh, the artist is the smallest entrepreneur. But in order to make real impact in the world, uh, and, and I so believe in making a single individual cry and be moved by a work of art, but in today's culture, designers have more of a, a responsibility in, in the context, obviously, of, of what is happening in the world. Um, there is a really beautiful saying by uh, uh, a French uh, uh, philosopher, writer, uh, Renaissance man, Exupéry, who says, you know, you can't get people to build a boat by drumming them around to collect wood and metal, uh, but you can teach them to long for the immensity of the sea. Uh, and, and that kind of longing, that shared vision, that sense of uh, looking to the horizon towards something much, much bigger than yourself, both in terms of space and time, meaning something that exists beyond the, the sense of the individual, beyond the sense of community, but also possibly beyond your lifetime, uh, is, is I think what uh, has, has uh, inspired us uh, for, for the past decade in terms of the projects that we selected and how, you know, 
how I thought about the we. I actually used we way well before we were a we, uh, and and well before you know I was pregnant with this gorgeous team of mine. And so I, I think um, we we should all be so lucky. So so how do you select the people to your team? What 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 competences skills does one have to bring to be able to join your team? I so I I often ask um, I often ask prospective team members to, to tell me about their childhood uh, and what they can share with me about their childhood. And I look for, uh, I always say shine and kindness. I look for that kind of technical shine and ability uh, to commit uh, to, to, to technical excellence uh, and, and also a compassion, a kindness, a, a, a gentleness of the heart. I really look for those two things. And um, and they're often found in, 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 in individuals who, who, who can relive their childhood as I did. Um, and so here, here you see the team at the opening of our show, Material Ecology, at the moment, which, by the way, has now officially reopened. Um, it was curated by Paola Antonelli and, uh, uh, and her wonderful team, uh, Anna, and, and the rest of the, the amazing team. And uh, it will be open until October 18th. Yeah, we will come to this a little bit later. Yeah. I'm definitely <laughs> very curious to, to learn more about this exhibition. But coming back to your team, maybe what was the most unusual career that somebody had coming in your team? I just remember, like in, in our case, in our Ars Electronica Future Lab, we uh, quite a while ago, we had uh, a woman coming to our team. She was a trained psychologist. And actually, within a few years, she uh, developed her own research area in robot psychology. And it was really exciting to see how very unusual careers are suddenly are coming together and, 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 and having such great outcome. And I'm sure this is even more so the case in your team. Uh, that is absolutely, absolutely true. And, and I can give, and I will, uh, several examples. But I think it's also true of the entire Media Lab. I mean, before I joined the Media Lab, you know, I read this is the place where if you have a degree in Chinese poetry and mechanical engineering, you know, you, you'll, you'll thrive. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, the same is true of my team. I mean, we have a computational design, you know, we have a robotic roboticist who's, you know, who studied graphic design and we have an industrial designer who, um, who, uh, uh, who has just graduated, but is an incredible roboticist and a marine biologist who is an incredible chemist and material scientist and a genius in additive manufacturing. And, um, and so I think, it's true for, uh, I guess, on the individual level, the, the interesting combination of disciplines, but also when you bring these individuals together, you sort of uh, 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 compound the skills um, in a factor larger than two uh, to the point where you get very, very interesting combinations of worldviews, uh, especially within a discipline. I mean, even within biology, uh, we have had um, recently graduated a um, a bio biologist who's a scientist and a biologist who's an engineer uh, or a bioengineer, and they see biology in very, very different ways. And the kind of productive and wonderful arguments between them have really helped uh, uh, us arrive at uh, projects that are meaningful uh, scientifically and technologically. It's wonderful and great and there is always this wonderful fantasy that when you have all these different brilliant minds together then something is happening but i think most of the time it's not happening on its own and these teams also need in a certain way leadership guidance i mean how how do you manage this i mean probably you usually get a lot of money for advice like this so but maybe you can share some some of your experience also in, in, in yeah. how do you guide the, the, this project yeah, well thank you for noticing it uh, <laughs> i think usually it, you know it's a little bit like johnny i've talking about the design of the apple products you know you look at this product and you assume it has always existed it was almost inevitable uh, and I think a great product or a great company or a great uh, team interaction seems inevitable in its positivity, beauty, uh, and elegance. But uh, actually, it's, it's, it's actually very, very uh, complicated to, to achieve that state of flow in that kind of scale. 
uh, and it requires uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, you know what they say, you have to point to the moon in order to get there. Um, so, so it requires pointing to the right direction. Um, and it requires um, understanding that the whole is bigger than the part. And, you know, and, and in providing vision, providing leadership, you always have to go back to the fundamental truths that guide you. You always have to go back to that whole. What is that whole? What is the bigger statement? What are we trying to achieve? And then how do you um, cut up the project into quote unquote digestible elements uh, that can, when they're brought together can build the, the bigger whole. And, and, and I find, I mean, as time goes by that the model of the quote unquote architect uh, leader who is, acts like a tyrant and is sort of the singular leader in the group works less and less, you know, it's, it's, it's really about teamwork and team collaboration uh, and um, ensuring enabling that kind of collaboration and understanding that the brain of the group is, I, I also think about the team as a single organism. And that has really helped me. Uh, over the years, I understood, ah, you know, this individual is, is you know, he, this individual acts as, uh, as part of the brain of the group. This individual acts as part of the op optical vision system of the group. This this individual can hear very well. This individual can see very well. This individual can touch the lives of people. This individual can speak our work very well. By the way, my team members do a much better job than I do at speaking, you know, the intricacy of the scientific contributions of our work. So, so when you think of the team as that organism, you don't see yourself as the center of the team, but you really try to think of how can each team member contribute to this bigger organism, I think, you know, there, there are miracles that, that, um, that lie uh, ahead in, in pursuing that approach. And, and I have been extremely grateful. The, the team um, is an incredible one. I think it's probably easy when you're MIT Media Lab to attract these talents, but probably it would be also very helpful if this kind of skills or at least a little bit of this and then this diversity would um, take place in many more areas of science, engineering, but even in the companies, because many of the people that are educated in our universities, they end up in corporate research and development. And also the companies are now very desperate to look for innovations and, and new business models. So what do you think? I mean, should scientists and engineers nowadays also be required to take art classes or even philosophy classes? I think absolutely yes. Um, I mean, you don't separate between, you know, Lego bricks and uh, I, I'm just thinking about my 16 month old child. I, you know, I don't separate between the toys that she plays with them. It's, it's reading, it's drawing, it's thinking, it's moving. Um, uh, I, 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 I think, um, yes, that, you know, at, at a single moment in time, there's you know, there's a moment where you say, okay, there is a difference between engineering and philosophy, you know, between the art of critical thinking, philosophy, and the art of invention and creation. You know, one is head in the sky versus feet on the ground. It's a different mentality, different worldview. Engineers are trained uh, from a very early age to uh, problem solve. Uh, philosophers are trained to problem seek or seek critical understanding of a problem. And so solving and seeking are, can clash, can, can uh, uh, create conflicts, but it actually is in this kind of conflict between problem solving and problem seeking that you get incredible opportunity uh, between, I would say, affirmative design, design that is problem solving and, um, and, uh, and, and design that is speculative, that is not about solving a, an existing problem, but maybe creating tools for problems that do not yet exist. Um, and so I think it is very, very important for critical thinkers to practice the art of making and for the makers to practice the art of critical thinking. And I mean, you, you, you very beautifully called uh, uh, Ars Electronica this year uh, in Kepler's garden, which I was like, this is, this is perfect. Uh, because when Kepler was alive, uh, you know, the, the fields of uh, uh, um, astronomy and astrology were definitely connected, but the fields of astronomy and uh, physics 
uh, were incredibly uh, disconnected, right? One was liberal arts, the other was natural philosophy. So there was definitely that kind of separation. And then Kepler really brought them together. I, I think Carl Sagan said of Kepler that he, he was the last scientific astrologist and the first astro-scientist. Uh, and, and I think we should all we should all aim to be Keplers. You know, we should all uh, raise our children to be Keplers. Um, and, and, and Kepler sort of, you know, we could not have reached Newton, one may claim, without Kepler. We could not have reached uh, the, the theory of relativity without Newton, who was, you know, inspired by Kepler, celestial astro astronomy and astrology. So I think uh, I think it is just incredibly important to practice the dichotomy between the, the how and the why uh, when you're approaching the what. And to always keep those three in, in mind, almost like exercise, how, why, what. And, and you're always wearing those different hats uh, every day, every hour, every second, every breath. Um, and that kind that exercises the brain to operate and to produce and to create from that kind of mental uh, approach and it's very very powerful it is a form of meditation i believe mm -hmm. you spoke about kepler and newton and of course newton said this you know about kepler that uh, he is standing on the shoulders of the giants so uh, i mean this is definitely true i think for all science but also for all art and uh, of course also uh, very successful and famous artists and scientists like you are standing on shoulders of giants. There's something everybody does. But then at some point you have to get off of it and, and find your own way. And I think this is something that you did um, very successfully in a field that uh, not many people have been brave enough to really, I mean, wonder wandering in this field of this crossover of art, science, and technology, it's very easy. It's nice to be like a tourist and say, okay, let's look how funny this is or how inspiring. But you really dedicated your career and your life, which is, I think, quite a risk-taking thing uh, because it was definitely not true in the beginning when we think 10 years ago uh, that something like your Mediated Matter uh, Group would be so successful. Now you have this wonderful exhibit, this retrospective. I mean, after 10 years of work, already a big retrospective at uh, MoMA. So we could really say it's now you are one of the giants and now uh, many other people are stepping on, on your shoulders. Maybe that's a good point now to talk a little bit more about your projects and your work, starting with uh, the, uh, this wonderful exhibit in MoMA which was closed down because of Corona, but now it's uh, finally open and, and, and people can see it. That's right. Um, so, uh, so we have opened, uh, uh, we were very, uh, uh, just sort of pre prefacing, um, I, I, I was reminded as you were talking of a moment I shared with a colleague of mine at the Media Lab, Patty Mace, who said, you know, you have to, you know, you have to decide, are, you know, are you building a kind of a star architect practice or do, do you want to dedicate your life to invention? Um, and, and I thought the latter, the latter is true, but that kind of life uh, requires a commitment and it requires responsibility. And it seems all very beautiful and again, effortless, but it requires a lot of work. And so these 10 slash 20 years of work uh, over the period of, um, my life as a student later, as a graduate student, as a professor, uh, have culminated in uh, this suite of tools and technologies that were then um, identified by Paola Antonelli, uh, a friend, a colleague, a mentor of mine, uh, at least um, for the past uh, 12 years. Uh, um, and, uh, and she had invited us to, to, to put together this wonderful exhibit and has um, very uh, thoughtfully uh, decided to only include uh, demos, not products, not final objects, uh, no wearables, no ar um, sort of fully fledged architectural structures or um, in a way legible product, so to speak, but only to, to create an a show that is entirely comprised uh, of processes which was challenging not only to us but also to the visitors um, and uh, and 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 that's so so beautifully 
uh, uh, was fitting with, with our approach, uh, in fact. So, so I think as you enter the exhibit, um, you see a, you know, a collection of eight projects, each of them proposing a new technology, a new way of thinking and making. And uh, you, you leave the exhibition, I hope, uh, with the understanding that not a single object in the show was created by a process that was not our own, meaning we invented all the technologies from glass printing to uh, bio incorporation uh, of, of, of hybrid living materials. Uh, uh, we invented all of these computational and digital fabrication tools to create these objects. Um, so this was early on uh, in, in the creation of, of, the, uh, of the group. We started uh, with the first iteration, the first generation of the 3D printer, uh, which was developed as an, a printer for optically transparent glass. Um, and this is the video of the first iteration of the technology. And you can see that the products that we've created were sort of lacking some control. Uh, and as we continue to develop the technology, we gain more and more control over the process. Again, the objects in this first iteration ended up in museums and galleries and were rightly considered as, you know, objects that are beautiful and tell a story. But more than that, they were the output of a new technology. And that new technology, uh, which was the pro product of uh, very skillful engineers working together to create it, um, also created new science. And it created new knowledge. And it created new theorems about how does this viscous liquid, um, this uh, glass act in high temperature, and what can we do uh, to control its shape uh, its and its properties, uh, and of course, um, immediately the 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 designers are thinking about uh, design applications. This is Marcus's uh, one of my team members, son Emil, uh, with with a glass printer product, the column. Uh, so of course, we move from the scale of the product to the scale of the column, from the column to the facade, from the facade to the skyscraper, and we kind of question. Uh, in the process of scaling up in terms of the architectural siting, uh, what do we need to change in the technology engineering wise in order to attack a bigger scale or a higher complexity. But what's interesting about this is that we never looked down on science and we also never used art as an opportunity. We really approached both worlds with innocence and, and we, we, we approach both as equal. There is no gender divide in the disciplines when, when we're in the room, you know, we, we sort of see, we see them as entire equals. And that, that ability uh, basically uh, implies that now we can use a technology to create science and we can use science to question design products and we can use design products. So uh, this, this is not a, a, the kind of the typical case where you look at science as a pool of metaphors or, a, or principles from which you then generate a technology. No, you generate a technology, uh, you engineer it, and then you produce science. And that's a very, very powerful moment when you can use art, design, and engineering to revisit scientific knowledge. That, that really, really excites me and, and definitely members of my team. I think that's an important point really for people to understand because uh, the example is very good with your glassworks. I mean, you look at them and of course you are intrigued to see them first of all purely as art and design projects. And even then when you read uh, or hear this is uh, a new 3D printing technology, you still have the idea that, okay, there is a new technology and now you have given shape to this technology. But I think what you are doing much more with this work is actually this reverse engineering, so to say, because we need also a new design thinking to be yeah. able to utilize and apply these technologies. And I think this is this uh, very nice circle where suddenly art and design is not only benefiting from new technology, but really helping these uh, new technologies to take shape and, and get into application. That's right, and and again, we're, we're sort of we've moved from the the age of enlightenment to the age of entanglement, to the age where uh, disciplines and domains and knowledge from different areas are entirely entangled, and uh, individuals who will truly be successful successful are those that are able <laughs> to have compassion towards that agenda and to kind of seek out um, the, the beautiful um, uh, in, in an intricate whole 
uh, as opposed to a compositional approach. And an engineer will practice a compositional approach. The soup and the salad is, is a good metaphor, actually. <laughs> you know, the engineer will, will engineer the most incredible salad. But what, what is interesting about the salad is, you, you know, what you put in, you, you, when you look at the salad, when you process, digest, eat it, enjoy it, you can see exactly what was put into the salad, meaning the whole equals the sum of its parts. But when you eat the soup, you know, you, you have to sort of imagine what went into the creation of this incredible, uh, in, incredible uh, and delicious, you know, feast. Uh, and so the soup sort of presents a whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. And, and, and that has always been sort of the, the, the chosen meal in my group, I would say, where we're not interested in compositional thinking or compositional making. Uh, we're not interested in taking things apart for the sake of putting them together in a new way, but we're interested in building systems, again, not products and not even processes, but systems that are uh, less product centric, less even human centric, uh, and more systems based. And that, of course, comes with a responsibility for societal issues, environmental issues, even economical issues now more than ever. Um, and, and in a way, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging to practice art and design today without having um, that responsibility on your shoulders to address at least, even by saying you're not addressing climate change, this, this is already an attitude, this is already a choice. And, and we, we make those choices every day in our every action and, and, and in the way we choose to treat our team members and, and our projects. Do you think that technology can help us to deal with the climate crisis? Yes. And how, and if I how do we have yeah. to sort of influence the world, the scientists, the, the engineers, the companies to follow this path? Yeah. Look, I think if the answer was, was no, this, this was sort of the, the, the end of it. I don't think there is a choice. Um, I think the, the answer must be yes. Uh, and um, in as much as we've created technologies to, to fight, you know, <laughs> the, 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 ironically, the most uh, interest, some of the most interesting innovations, technologically speaking, came from war, you know, and, and ended up changing the world. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I think back, as I always do, uh, one of my favorite movies of all times, Odyssey 2000, uh, Space Odyssey 2001, um, by Kubrick uh, of this first scene, nine minutes of complete silence when um, Kubrick is sort of taking us from the ape uh, who is, you know, using a bone to, uh, to declare warfare on another ape that has conquered a, a water pool and uh, springs this, uh, this bone in the sky and, and you know, in, in a period of whatever, how many seconds, the bone transforms into an orbital uh, spacecraft. And here in nine minutes, you have sort of, you know, 400 uh, million years of, of evolution. Um, I, I think... Um, this, uh, this is 4 million, I should say, but nature is 4 billion years old. <laughs> but I think one way or another, um, uh, this notion that, you know, whatever technology, when we can utilize te technology, you can utilize it for bad, you can utilize it for good. Uh, and, and so I think there are so many interesting technologies out there, um, additive manufacturing being one of them, uh, that... Um, inspire a different way of thinking about the physical environment. And I think that the project I presented earlier at Gohocha definitely questions that, that paradigm and proposes that we can now and must uh, design products. Um, we must design the, the structure of the products and how they quote unquote grow, but we, we must also design their decay. And if we can design products that, um, you know, that turn into other products, products, we're sort of looking at a culture where there is no waste and there's incarnation of, of one product into another uh, that is artfully uh, or artistically incredibly poetic. But of course, if we can translate it to the real world, uh, it will make a big difference. And, um, and, and, and we hope that many are focusing on, the, on that. And, and again, there are so many example, good examples of, uh, of that kind of work at the Media Lab, but as well in, in the world. And in particular in your group and, and one of the projects, which is one of my favorites and I think a very well-known project is the Silk Pavilion, 
which is not only this wonderful aesthetic uh, sculpture that you made it into, but I like it so much because it really shows very nicely this very special approach of you, how you deal with this form follows function or the other way around the question, but also, of course, uh, the way how your work is always showing that art and design is not only benefiting from technology, but challenging it, inspiring and really creating new directions or offering new directions. So maybe you can talk a little bit about this project. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at uh, this beautiful site in Italy in Abano Terme, um, where we've landed with this incredible uh, researcher, Silvia Capellozzi and her lab, the Sericulture Lab, um, where silkworms live you know, amongst these organically grown, uh, um, organically grown uh, trees and incredible wineries. Uh, and we have reapproached Silk Pavilion 1 in the creation of Silk Pavilion 2, this time uh, using not 6,500 silkworms that were FedExed, but 17,532 <laughs> silkworms to be exact, um, that were um, sourced at, at the very side and organically in, you know, fed organically grown mulberry leaves. Uh, so we, um, in this project, we attempted to sort of revisit Silk Pavilion 1 through multiple lenses, where, um, where, where again, we ask uh, in one of the most um, important industries, textile, the textile industry, how can we revisit that industry through the lens of co-fabrication? Meaning, can an architect, can a designer, can an artist, can an engineer uh, co-create with another life form, in this case, the beautiful silk moth, uh, the, bom the, the Bombay Mori, um, to create structures for cohabitation, uh, both humans and... So again, this is less product-centric, more process-centric, but I would say less human-centric and more species-centric. You know, How can we think about designing in a world where all species are treated uh, equally? Not only genders are treated equally, but also species. Other species are, are, are treated equally. Uh, as we know in the silk industry, the silk moth, um, the cocoon is boiled to separate between the fibers and the glue. Uh, the fibers and the matrix uh, and the silkworms, uh, unfortunately, uh, get exterminated. And in this process, uh, the silk moths build together with us and metamorphosize together with us. Uh, and um, and we follow this beautiful process and uh, and and enable maybe this is <laughs> a charged word but that beautiful uh, and natural metamorphosis to create uh, the the silk pavilion. The silk pavilion in its second iteration was built from three layers. This is um, its installation at the gallery in the Museum of Modern Art. The first layer was this cable system that was produced by a robot. The second layer was a water soluble mesh. And the third layer was the actual silk uh, that was drawn out of the, the, you know, the silk, the silk moth itself. So in, in a way, this was a machine, a robot, uh, a robot, a human, and a silkworm working together to create a whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, and what you see here, interestingly, there was a jig, which you saw on the previous slide, and that jig rotated, I, I forget, every 15 minutes, 90 degrees. So uh, about 15,000 uh, rotation through the duration of the construction. Um, and as it rotates, the silkworms climb northward, upward, as they were, quote unquote, trained by natural selection and, and evolution. Um, they climb upwards and the density of silk that is, uh, deposited uh, across the surface area of the structure is informed by that movement of the underlying jig. Interestingly, you see the big holes that were, uh, you know, human-made uh, to 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 control uh, in the environmental factors uh, um, uh, imparting certain conditions on the pavilion. There was also uh, another interesting thing that happened is we started seeing these little holes in the structure. And those little holes were the excretions of these, these lovely creatures, the silkworms, um, uh, that um, created these, the excretion created these holes and the holes released energy, structural energy in the structure, which enabled um, the quote unquote optimization of, of the mesh along the structure. So this was a very interesting collaboration uh, between 
um, digital fabrication, uh, material science, and of course, you know, biology uh, to, to, to create the structure um, and a structure that's definitely larger than the size of each of its contributors. And it was a wonderful experience and one that really uh, invites the visitors to question a uh, sericulture and question how we treat uh, other organisms. Uh, I, again, ironically, the silk moth is the most domesticated, but um, but but still, when you think about it, you you know you waste you kill a thousand silk moths for a single t-shirt, uh, and so that this sort of invites you to think about the economy of scale uh, in terms of relationships between biological species, material output, and technology in the bigger context of eco GDP. Great. Um, our program directors just gave us 10 more minutes, <laughs> which I'm very thankful because That's we can. <laughs> uh, maybe, um, I mean, of course, if there are some, some other projects of the exhibition that you would like to refer to, that's something uh, I'm very happy to hear about. Uh, and also, I maybe would like to ask you some question about the relationship between art, science, and industry. I mean, these are three very different cultures, in particular when it comes to issues like, you know, who owns ideas, copyrights, IP rights. Um, we learn this very often in, in, in this uh, project. And it sounds so nice again to have, you know, artists, scientists, everybody collaborating, and oh, it's a wonderful world. But then, of course, always comes the moment when projects are successful, and then suddenly, who owns these projects, who gets the merits, not just the credits, but who also can financially benefit from it. How in, in, in your experience, I mean, the MIT Media Lab, of course, is a, a huge uh, transformator of all these things. What are your experiences here and, and, and what could be your recommendations also to, to young designers and artists who want to go in a closer contact uh, with this world of engineering and, and even industry and business? Yeah, so I think through that trajectory, the sort of decade long trajectory, I think I started off as a rebel thinking, you know, I'll eat rice, listen to Beethoven and do my work um, with, you know, without regard for the industry and uh, industrial or economical forces. And I find myself in a very interesting place today where, uh, um, you know, ac actually I, 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 it, I uh, you know, I, in 2005, I already started thinking about this question as a student, um, you know, is this work art um, for, you know, can, can I move a single person or is this work uh, going to make a, a huge difference in, people's life and, and 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 of course art does too but to take your your question uh, first to the past before I go to the future so I, I take you 40,000 years to the past <clears throat> the, you know the first um, the origin of art actually started with the cave paintings and when you think about the cave paintings in the south of France uh, 40,000 years ago 37,000 years ago um, th they were incredible works of art uh, but they were actually not designed as such. They, they were designed, you know, we have no mention of who the artist was, um, and they were not designed to be de deployed and displayed in a gallery. They were designed in a cave um, with, you know, a, a community of hunters and gatherers that were felt that they had to express to themselves the reality outside of the cave in order to face reality. So this was, of course, sort of human, the, the human story told through the lens of a zoology-centric world, you know, where we were still afraid of the behemoths, uh, to, to, a, to an age today where we are controlling zoology around us and we're harming nature around us. And, and, and in this duration, you, you, you sort of understand, wow, art was actually an instinct. It was not created for credit. You know, it was not created to place the human center stage. It was created in order for us to be able to deal with the problems that we face in the world and to find ways philosophically and otherwise technologically to deal with it. And, and I think now we are facing a similar moment where all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the way we are dealing with a, a, a crisis of epidemiology, the crisis of the pandemic, the crisis of global warming, 
um, I take center stage, I mean, even in, 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 the, in the elections, uh, you hear about ways by which to represent the truth and, um, and, and more so than ever, uh, those facts are so, so important to everything material that we create in our environment. So now I forgot what you asked me, but my point is that uh, the business industry, of course, it's very, very important to, um, to always keep in mind uh, not to bow at the service of, of econ economical forces, but to understand them and use them for your benefit. Uh, and always, always, always lead through a value system. And I think a good example for that, and sorry to bring Alon again to the conversation, but is SpaceX and how, you know, SpaceX failed three times. And here you have an individual that, you know, created uh, um, uh, resources through PayPal for understanding the economy of the social networks in the context of banking um, and, and created enough capital for him to not uh, challenge NASA, but actually to help NASA, so single-handedly with his team, uh, and through that process, reinvent you know the electric car and uh, and deploy it. Uh, to, you know, so I think there are incredible examples out there, with Tesla being one of them, uh, of ways to not only um, uh, understand the perception of of economical forces, but also use them to your benefit. Because at the end of the day, the units of work, meaning currency, are not equal to the units of perception. Units of perception cannot be quantifiable. And, and it's very, very important to, to, to understand that difference between work and perception and how you unify those. Anyway, long-winded answer to say that, uh, that it is an opportunity, that we have an opportunity as builders and makers and technologists to approach a very broken economical system uh, and to fix it from the ground up, it's a very, very exciting moment. Tragic, but also with an opportunity to, to help nature help itself. So probably when artists have succeeded to repair the broken economy, maybe artists can also help to repair many uh, broken political systems we have all over yeah. the planet right now. But I think what's seriously talking again, what's behind all this is really uh, big call for taking out the responsibility, which is, of course, not only to the artists, uh, but to the whole society. At the end, I think uh, all of us, also as individuals, as laymen, we have to understand that technology is not necessarily the enemy, but it is uh, a means that we can use to express ourselves, to empower ourselves, but it always comes with responsibility. And I think this is one of the, I think, important messages that I take very much from your work and your career, that you have never shied away from, from embracing both things, not just, you know, utilizing technology, having fun with art and design, but always showing responsibility uh, as the first and, and major issue of your work. So with this phrasing words, and you really deserve them, I have to say it was a wonderful pleasure to, to talk with you. It was so much more enjoyable than just listening to a talk, to be able uh, to really ask the, these questions and get so many uh, background uh, information social from your side. Um, thank you very much for joining us. So much, and of great. course, not only politeness dictates it, but I would give you the last word. Thank you. So I, I, I want to thank my team, uh, my family, um, my, my intellectual family who, uh, who have for so many years now contributed to an incredible body of work and vision and worked so hard along with me and with each other to, to support each other uh, in the face of great challenges, uh, um, pandemics and, and other challenges. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just so humbled uh, to have you know, to have uh, grown this body of work with, with such an incredible family. So I wanted to take take this minute and thank my team. And of course, thank Paula and her team at the Museum of Modern Art for the opportunity to show this work at, at such a, in such a timely, timely place. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much, Gerfried. And thank you to our Electronic Arts. Love you guys. Hope next time we'll see you here in person in Linz. That's thank right. Thank you very much and good luck with so your much. work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>